Okay, welcome everybody to the week of Gvura. Uh, we are officially in Tiferet Shev Gvura. And uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Nuriel Shore, and this is the second class of our seven part series of the Omer Aliyah, a seven week spiritual boot camp of personal elevation. The Omer Aliyah is an initiative of Chai Fire Circle, an inclusive and creative Jewish community that shapes intentional spaces utilizing Torah wisdom in order to foster spiritual expression and authentic self-discovery. The intention behind the Omer Aliyah is a spiritual detox of the klipot, the barriers that are preventing us from accessing Hashem in our true selves, while simultaneously building a foundation of spiritual power to live the rest of our lives with. Practically speaking, the theme of the, the Omer Aliyah is Tikkun Amidot, repairing, refining, and elevating our character attributes. Just as Hashem manifests loving kindness, we try to live with loving kindness. Just as Hashem manifests strength through restraint, we try to live with strength through restraint, so on and so forth. By emulating these divine attributes, we transform into conduits of peace, love, and blessing for ourselves, for others, and for all of creation. The structure of the boot camp consists of four in-person community gatherings in Los Angeles, seven online classes, 49 days of individual learning and growth, as well as a spiritual council network of guides who have offered to have private one-on-one -on -one conversations. For more information on the Omer Aliyah or Chai Fire Circle, you can contact me at omeraliyah at gmail.com. We are currently in the week of Gavua, and tonight we have the zakhut of having David Sachs, senior lecturer at the Happy Minion of Los Angeles, and gives the weekly podcast, Spiritual Tools for an Outrageous World. He is also an Emmy and Golden Globe winner, winning writer and producer for television. Before we begin, a few housekeeping remarks. This class is being recorded and will be uploaded to the, YouTube, the Omar Aliyah YouTube channel. So please hold all your questions and comments until after the class is completed. I will then stop the recording, after which we will have an opportunity for open and confidential conversation. May Hashem bless the Omer Aliyah and all who are involved so that Klai Yisrael may discover the greatness within and bring out individual, collective, and global ukula speedily in our days. I now hand the class over to you, David. I don't think we can hear you just yet. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to speak about Kavora. Um, that in itself may sound curious. Like, I, I think that a lot of people, given the choice of which, which Mita they, they want to talk about, the, the last one they would pick is Gavura. Um, let me give for you a, a, just a quick and easy translation for Gavura. Gavura usually means din, which means judgment. Um, it can mean uh, power. It can mean limitation or, or formation or shape. All this will make a lot more sense uh, after we finish explaining this stuff. But, but there's a certain harshness that's usually associated with Gevorah because it's, Gevorah is kind of the opposite of Chesed. So if you know that Chesed is translated as kindness, you get what I'm saying right now. So why would anyone want to speak on the opposite of kindness? And the truth is, is that you really need Gevorah for, for kindness to become manifest, for this world actually to, to function, you need something to, um, to bring kindness into a place where it can actually be received. So, so let's, um, let's explain it even better. You know, imagine someone's really thirsty and you say, oh, listen, I, I'm gonna get you a drink of water, absolutely. And so what you do is you take an industrial strength fire hose and you open it up in their face, right? And it's just like, the water just like streams out. It's a water can and it like knocks the person off their feet and, and, and they don't get any water. So it's, it's like literally the worst of all worlds. So how can you do it? What, what do you want to do? You want to be able to have a faucet which measures out the water and so that it can come into a kli, into a cup. And now by constricting that awesome flow, all of a sudden it can be received and it benefits the other person. Okay, so now instead of thinking of this massive water cannon, imagine the infinity of God. How does God share himself with us? 
So if if God was like, well, I want to inspire you. Here, here it comes. Here comes some God. We would be absolutely obliterated. We the 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 finite cannot withstand the infinite. The finite becomes obliterated in the face of the infinite. And so, so if the infinite stands for the goodness of God or chesed, then what is God going to do so that his infinite good can be received by limited creatures like us? And that's where Gevorah enters. Gevorah begins to compact the light, right? So we have a, a Kabbalistic term called tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is actually the process through which God made the world, created the world. So just to explain it, God exists in infinite form. We'll use a, 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 a Kabbalistic term for God, or ein sof, which means light without end. That's just one way of just um, articulating the, the, the infinite nature of God. God is light without end. So what God wants to do is he wants to create a space where there's such a thing as a human being, a creature that can actually choose to serve God. And this is interesting because believe it or not, human beings are higher than angels because angels don't have any free choice. In other words, angels see this quantumly higher aspect of revealed godliness. And in the face of that, they're, they're paralyzed, so to speak. In other words, they can only do good. But God conceived of a creature where it wasn't so clear that God even existed. That God sort of hid his light so that we actually had a choice. And now we could choose to serve God. So we're actually unique in all of the spiritual worlds as the only creature that's able to choose to serve God through free choice. Now, how did God create this realm where free choice was even possible? So the way he did it was he sort of emptied out a space within himself, within this infinite light. He created this space. And in that space, which was dark, so to speak, see, it's kind of funny because we call it the vacated space. But this great Kabbalistic joke is that the vacated space is also filled with godliness because <laughs> there is no space devoid of godliness. It's, it's all God. But God sort of like, lessened his light. Now, how did he lessen his light? Well, that's a process called tzimtzum, which is gevorah. Okay? So, so if you think about it, from an Einsteinian level, we have this great equation, E equals mc squared, which is that energy becomes mass. So think of the divine light the initial, this orange so the, the initial light as energy, right? And so what God then did after he created this empty space within himself, this sort of like playing field where the world is going to be created, he then took this thing called the kav. It's like a beam of light. And he shone this beam of light and he compacted it and compacted it and compacted it till energy became mass, like Einstein, right? Energy becomes the physical universe. Divine light becomes everything we see around us. That's an amazing thing because God is utterly revealed around us because it, everything remains all God, but at the same time, he's hidden. So this is, <laughs> this is quite a feat that God did. It's called, in English, we call this Hiding in plain sight. You know, I, I, I once came up with a, a, a thing, I've repeated it a million times, but it explains what, what I'm going after right here, which is a conversation between two fish, right? So one fish says to the other, do you believe in water? 
And the other fish says, you know, I don't know if I believe in water. My grandfather was very religious. He believed in water. And what's the joke? The joke is the only thing that's going on is water. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing that exists. So I was having lunch with a friend of mine. And, and I asked him, I said, where did you park your car? And he said, across the street. And I said, do you realize you can't get to your car without swimming through godliness? Right? Do, do, do you understand what it is? God is literally all around us, but he's also hidden himself at the same time so that we have this free choice. Now, there's so many implications to this. It's, 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 it's beyond. But I just, want to, I just want to kind of try to correct this notion of that, that, that gavura or din judgment, this mita that we're talking about right now, or, or even the hiding of the light so that we can have free choice is, is a negative thing. You see, there's a teaching that, that many people are familiar with. Um, but I, I don't, in my personal opinion, don't feel as though they fully understand it. And, and it, I think it negatively colors their understanding of God. So let me, let me tell you what the teaching is. And this teaching, by the way, is proper and correct, but I just want to explain it better, okay? The teaching goes like this. In the beginning, God wanted to create the world from a standpoint of gavur, or din, or perfect judgment. But he understood that people were fallible and that if he created the world from this place of gavura or perfect din, perfect judgment or absolute judgment, that human beings wouldn't stand a chance. That, that, that humanity, that the universe itself could not survive under those circumstances. And so as a result, what God did was he sweetened the din with chesed, with kindness. And now with this mix of judgment and kindness, humanity and the world can survive. And you can have this ongoing universe. Okay, that teaching is 100% true. But let me tell you where I think people misunderstand it. When we say that God initially desired to create the world from a standpoint of of din, of judgment, that sounds like God's a really bad guy, doesn't it? <laughs> like God is like this incredibly strict principle. And it's sort of like, oh boy, here's what I want to do. I want to have the strictest universe in the world. That would be my greatest desire but now you're going to ruin my fun, you imperfect people, and you're going to have to make me throw kindness in there. You're ruining my good time, says God. Now I have to be nice. Do, 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 well, you heard that with your emotional intelligence while I was explaining the teaching. <laughs> Whether you would have put it in those words or not is something else. But believe me, that's the impression of God that comes across in that, in that teaching. And so let me try to do a better job of explaining what I just said. And when, when that happens, you'll also get a better sense of what Gavura is as well. You see, it's not that God desires judgment or strictness or harshness. God who is perfect longs for everything to be perfect. <laughs> God, who is perfect, longs to share his perfection with his creations. Doesn't that sound a lot better? But it's also a lot truer. It's a lot truer. It's not that God is strict. It's that God is perfect. And that God longs for the perfection of the universe. And the truth is, it's the destiny of the universe that God implanted within the universe for there to be perfection. There's going to be perfection. That is, that is the, the narrative of creation. That is the destiny of creation. But until we get there, God tempers it with mercy. 
in order to give us the chance to arrive at that place in wholeness and in peace. And so that's really, that, that's really the story of creation. And that's really the story of Gavor. Now, let me give it to you from yet a different perspective. All these things are saying the same thing, but I'm giving it to you from different angles, okay? There's a fascinating story in the Torah. The Torah just kind of alludes to it. But if you look at the Rashi in, in the beginning of Breshis, it's one of the very first verses of the Torah. God refers to creating these giant sea creatures, right? Called the Leviathan. In, in English, we call them the, the Leviathan. And God creates the male Leviathan and the female Leviathan. And then it says that God took away the female Leviathan. Why? Because had these two giant sea monsters mated, their offspring would have been so huge and so numerous that they would have destroyed the world. Okay? So what did God do? He took the female Leviathan and he brought it up to the next world, to Olam Abba, and he's saving it for us to feast on when the world is perfected. All right. So, so you can have a lot of questions about that story, by the way. That invites a lot of questions. But let me give you a very deep understanding of it. And um, I'm teaching you right now from a, a very holy book called the Afike Yam. And this is by Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver, who is one of our greatest Kabbalists from about 200 years ago. And he, he talks at great, great length. And we're not going to get into all of it. But I'm going to give you a very radical uh, reading. Of, of what this means. You see, I don't know about you, but I was very content with the explanation that you've got two massive sea creatures, and if they have offspring, they are going to physically destroy the universe. That's, you know, with, within metaphysics, sounds perfectly good to me, right? No problems there. Except Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver says something deeper. He says, that what does the Leviathan, what does this, this creature stand for? For good, for chesed, right? For kindness. And the idea is that if you had these two massive producers of kindness, and they were just, their offspring was more and more and more and more kindness, that all that, that was existed in the world was kindness. That would destroy the world because the world would no longer be a place of free choice where there was enough hiddenness of God where one could choose to serve him. And so the whole purpose of the world would have been destroyed. That's what it, that's what it means. Do, do you understand that? Do, do you get that? Very, very deep. Very, very deep. In other words, for this world to exist, you have to have that balance between chesed, kindness, and gavura, in order to create that free choice. Now I'm going to tell you something very, very deep. If you take the gematria, of the word Leviasa, that's the numerical equivalent of the word Leviasa, which is Leviathan, this fish that we're talking about, which stands for kindness. It's 496. Do you know what that's the same gematria as the word Malchus? Malchus means this world. That's the Kabbalistic term for this dimension that we live in, this world. In other words, this world is a manifestation of kindness. Okay? But now I want to go even deeper. I'm going to tell you just a wild gematria. And what's wild about what I'm about to tell you, by the way, what I'm about to tell you now is from this book called the Pischei Sharim, and it's by the same author 
as this book, <laughs> the Epikeyam that I just told you about. <laughs> okay? So the Pischi Sharm is also Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac Haver. And what he's doing is giving you the entire history of the creation of the world and, and, and so much more. He's just one of the most awesome, awesome holy rabbis ever. Okay. So now listen to this. We know our mystical tradition is that God created the world from the Hebrew letters. Okay. So, so like I always joke because I think that's such an easy thing to misunderstand. This is what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God took a Dalid and a tough and bang them together and made Detroit, <laughs> right? That's, that's not what it means. Let's get back into our quantum physics, Einsteinian mode again. Basically, the different letters of the Hebrew alphabet stand for different energy wavelengths. That's, that's the best way to understand it. And so, so God created the world, the universe, out of the olive base, out of the Hebrew letters, meaning to say, that God took his divine light, this different wavelengths of divine energy, and he combined them together, like E equals MC squared, till energy became mass. Divine light became the physical universe. Okay. So now listen to this. You want to hear something absolutely wild? And I'm going to tell you the methodology in a moment. I'll work through the math with you in a moment. If you add up all the letters of the Aleph base, Right? What did we just say? God created the world with the Hebrew letters. If you add Aleph is one, Bez is two, Gimel is three, then let's go all the way up to 10. Yud is 10. Then the next letter is Chaf is 20. So now it's going to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Then it's going to go on Kuf, 100, Resh, 200, Shin, 300, Taf, 400. Okay? That's how it works. Now listen to this. I'm going to do the math for you in a moment. But if you add up all of the letters of the Aleph base, it comes to the gematria of the word malchus. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Because we just said that God with the letters made this dimension called the world, this universe. So the letters actually add up to the world, to the word, this world, world, malchus. That's amazing. But now let me do the math for you, okay? Because he uses a Kabbalistic methodology, which is fascinating. And I'm going to, I'm going to give an explanation for it too. Well, if you do Aleph through 10, that's one through nine, okay? Um, and then you do Yud through Tzadi, that's, that's 10 through 90, what you're going to get is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 equals 45. 10 plus 20 plus 30 plus 40 plus 50 plus 60 plus 70 plus 80 plus 90 is 450. So 450 plus 45 is 495. Okay, now here comes the really fascinating part. Kuf is 100, Resh is 200, that gives us 300. Shin is 300, that gives us 600. And Tuf is 400, that gives us 1,000. So now look what he does. He takes the number 1,000, and there's a system of gematria called Mispar Kutten, that means the small number. That means where you drop the zeros. Okay, so 1,000 becomes the number one. So what did we have? 495 plus one equals 496, which is the word machus. <laughs> okay, so now what is the Kabbalistic idea behind that that makes that methodology make sense? And you're going to hear something that's going to really, I think, make amazing sense. Listen to this. A lot of people don't know this. Mystically speaking, 
when 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 God created the world out of the letters, believe it or not, he didn't start with the letter Aleph and finish off with the letter Taf. He started with the letter Taf and he finished with the letter Aleph. Now that's called Tashrik. That's the name of that system of, of letter arrangement, okay? Now remember, the idea of the letters themselves as embodiment of energy already is a form of gavura, because God is already kind of reducing this infinite light into a particular wavelength. In this case, each of the wavelengths is a letter. So that's already a compacting of the light. That's already an expression of gavura. Okay, so now, Understanding that the letter tough comes first, now all of a sudden, remember, God is going to take great light and compact it down. Well, what's the first expression of light? The letter tough, which is 400. Then what's the next one? 300. Then what's the next one? 200. <laughs> then what's the next one? 100. Do you see the compacting of light happening before your very eyes? And do you see the logic of starting with the last letter of the Aleph base, Tav, before you get down to the Aleph? And so you see before yourself another model of Gavura in action, the compacting of the light. And what's the end result? This universe, because all the letters end up adding up to Mahus, which is this dimension. Okay. Now, why does God compact his light? Why does he do that? And let me rephrase the question. In Pirkei Avos, it says that God created the world with 10 utterances. So if God is infinite and God can absolutely do anything and nothing is hard to, for God, well, everyone should have the same question. Why not create the world with one utterance? Why are you creating the world with 10 utterances? So I saw a great explanation from Samson Rafael Hirsch, who said the following, that God basically, well, he didn't use this expression, but God left a paper trail. <laughs> that what God, God didn't want to do it all at like, like you know, he didn't want to do it all at once because then we would never figure out any aspect of creation. But God did it in progressive increments so that we could at least follow on some level the steps of creation itself. And so God, so to speak, revealed and unpacked his process of creation so that we could have some way of accessing how it was that God created the world. So he did it in 10 steps. That was for our benefit, so that we could get a better grasp of godliness. Okay. So when God compacts his light, he does it in measures. And he does it so that we have a better ability to understand who he is and, 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 and what he's doing. Um, and so, so I'll just end on this point, which is we're counting toward the number 50 right now. Um, everybody knows the sphere of process that we're talking about right now in week two, which is the week of Gavura, um, is going to lead up to the 50th day, to the revelation of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Now, that's really interesting because if each day we're counting and the Torah is given on the 50th day, which is the point of all the counting, it seems that we're leading up to this big day where we count the number 50. And yet that doesn't happen <laughs> in classic Jewish <laughs> riddle making, you know? We count to 49 and we stop there. But why? The whole point is to get to the 50th day. 
We're counting every single day and we don't count the number 50. Why? And here's the answer. Because the difference between the third day and the fourth day, or the 19th day and the 20th day, or the 30th day and the 31st day, cannot compare to the difference between the 49th day and the 50th day. The 50th day represents the infinite. And the infinite can't be counted. You can't put a number on it. You can't put limitations on it. The infinite represents Hashem, and he gives us the gift of revealing his infinite light to us. It's nothing that we can earn. It's just something we can prepare ourselves for. And then it's given as a gift. Now, with that in mind, I want to tell you something really, really wild. We've been talking a lot about gematria, and appropriately so today, because to quantify things is a real aspect of what gavura is all about. It's, it's things taking shape, things being quantifiable, the infinite breaking down to the finite. That's all gavura. So when you give a gamatria to a certain word. Well, you take two different words and each, if they share the same number, will teach you something about the other word. They'll, they'll share the same DNA spiritually, if you will. Well, that's always true. Sometimes it's harder to see, but sometimes it's really confounding because the two words are total opposites. And I'll give you my favorite example. The gematria of the word nachash, which means snake, as in the snake in the Garden of Eden, is the same gematria as the word Mashiach, <laughs> which is astounding because you can't imagine two greater opposites in all of Torah, the, the redemption itself and the embodiment of evil itself. What is the relationship between these two words? How can they possibly share the same gematria? And it's actually quite understandable once you know the reason. You see, many people, most people think that God created a perfect world. That was the Garden of Eden, and we blew it. <laughs> and what we're trying to do, the whole history of creation is trying to get back to zero. That's all we're trying to do, just get out of debt. Um, okay, so that's, that is not it, by the way. That, that is not what's going on. As, as Reb Shlomo Karlach put it so brilliantly, if the, if the Garden of Eden was so perfect, then what was the snake doing there? <laughs> I mean, that's an, an awesome, awesome teaching. Awesome, awesome teaching. In other words, the world wasn't finished yet. And God created us to be partners with him to finish the world. And so what the snake represented was, was unfinished energy, raw unfinished energy. And our job was to say no to the snake. In other words, to harness that energy. And if we had been successful in harnessing that nachash, that snake energy, do you know what the result would have been? Mashiach. Because then that first, that seventh day, that first seventh day, remember, human beings were created on the sixth day. That seventh day wouldn't have just been the first Shabbos, it would have been the great Shabbos. It would have been the end of history. Okay, so now let's go a little bit deeper. I was looking at the word Nachash, and I was looking at the word Mashiach, and I wanted to know what letters were different. And this is fascinating. The Ches, or rather the Nun of Nachash, which is the number 50, the number that we're counting toward, Right? That's why we're talking about this. We're counting toward the number 50. The letter nun in Nachash gets broken down in the word Mashiach to a mem and a yud. Mem is 40, yud is 10. And isn't that interesting? The letter nun, which represents the infinite, gets broken down in Mashiach to 40 and 10. Now, does 40 and 10 sound familiar when we're talking about the revelation of the Torah at Mount Sinai? It should. It should. 
because the Ten Commandments were given to Moshe over a period of 40 days. So now let's think about that. Do you know how the snake, how the number 50, if you will, manifests itself in our lives so often? By us becoming overwhelmed. We don't have vessels to hold the light. We get overwhelmed, we get flustered, and then we make a mistake. But what if you took that nun energy, that 50 energy of Nachash, and you broke it down to 40 and 10? If you made that energy into digestible Torah content, like Moshe did for us with the 40 and the 10, the 10 commandments being revealed in that period of 40 days, then you can take this great light and through Gevorah, through Tzimtzum, you can divide it up into something that becomes manageable in your life. So I'm going to give you a very practical tool. There's so much more to discuss, but I'm going to end here because I think we're at our time. And here's the, here's the practical tool. I mean, I know we talked about a lot of high-flying Kabbalistic ideas right now. But I want to make an advertisement for making to-do lists, right? Isn't that kind of funny that this whole discussion is leading to a practical suggestion of making to-do lists. Because I don't know if you're like me, everyone's different, but a, a lot of times I'll go, oh, I have to do something and I don't write it down, and it flies out of my head. And then I'll remember two weeks later, and now maybe I'm late on the thing, and now I'm like really anxious and guilty and feeling overwhelmed by it. Not because I'm a bad person or because I didn't want to do it. I just forgot. There's so many things to do. Well, if you can carry around a little piece of paper with you, or in the morning, or whenever it works for you, when you have your coffee or tea or whatever it is, you write down a list of things that you need to do. You actually have it right there. And it's so simple, but you can literally change your life by breaking down that overwhelming energy and using Gavura as your best friend break it down into a list, and now you have it in front of you, and now you can help bring Mashiach. <laughs> okay. Amen. Wow. David, Reb David, thank you so, so much uh, for that illuminating talk on Gua. Um, there's, there's so much to unpack here, and of course, we don't have enough time to be able to unpack everything, but I do want to thank you for the the taste of these unbelievable concepts. And um, I look forward in a couple of minutes when I stop the recording for us to have a conversation about kind of more of the practical applications of these concepts. Um, I mean, the to-do list and also um, the whole notion of not getting overwhelmed. Um, but in any case, thank you again, David. I really, really, really appreciate it. And uh, um, I will now stop the recording and we will have that conversation.